Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Grade 12 University Physics, here with Mr. Stone. Uh, so now we're still in Unit 5, this is Lesson 2. Uh, so in Lesson 1, we, we had this big idea, this big universal law that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames of reference. Speed of light is the one constant in the universe. There is no absolute spatial frame of reference, and there is no absolute temporal frame of reference. And it can cause some, some confusion in terms of, of, of simultaneity, of causality. What happens first? What, which, who's correct? And it, it changes our view of, of how things happen at high speeds. And you'll see in this, this lesson here that it's, it's going to really do some strange things. So let's think now uh, about those two rocket ships. Now we're going to use the flashlights again, but we're going to use those flashlights now Instead of pointing them at the other rockets, we're going to use them internally as a clock. We're going to take our flashlight, I see a light bulb here at the bottom, and it's going to reflect off of some mirror and bounce back down to a detector. So the time it takes for the light, now this is you know, theoretically impossible, right? But, but we're just going to use this in our, in our thought experiment as our, as our clock. We're going to use something traveling at the speed of light as our clock. It's going to go up, it's going to come down, and it's going to um, tick. Say. So every time it goes up and down, that's another tick in our clock. And we're going to use that as our time. Because we know that the speed of light is constant, right? We're not going to change this, this height here. And we know that the speed of light is constant. So that ticking, right, because time is uh, velocity, so the time it takes is going to be equal to the speed of light divided by the length. Okay. So let's say we have two rockets. They both have um, clocks in them. One's not moving, one's in the rest frame, and one's moving at some speed v. And there's an observer looking at both. Okay. There's an observer inside both, and there's an observer outside. So the ship that's not moving we already just showed that the time it takes for one tick is going to be, oh, so I had L. So it's going to go up and down, so it's going to have to go 2L. So the distance it takes is going to go L up, L down, so 2L divided by the speed of light, which is the speed at which the photon goes up and comes back down. So that's our time. So the time that the observer inside the ship sees and the time that the observer outside the ship sees are the same. So the two objects which are at rest, no problem. Everything works out. Now for the moving ship, as the source and detector moves at some speed v, the light is going to travel not straight up and down now. It's going to travel at an angle because the whole frame of reference is moving. So this is looking from outside. From outside, the moving ship. We're going to see as the ship moves, right, the light's going to go up, but because the ship's moving, it's going to travel at an angle instead. So instead of just the, just the, in the stationary frame, it's up and down, right? Nothing moves. But because the ship is moving at a set of speed v, it has to go up and then come back down. So it's going to have travel a new distance, which we're going to call capital D, right? And the distance uh, horizontally is going to be v times what we're going to call delta t prime. This is the time that we are going to observe from the outside. From the rest frame, we are going to observe that the time that's happening inside the ship is v delta t. So delta t prime is the time for the light to go up and down inside the ship from the outside frame of reference, from the observer looking at the ship go by them at V. Okay? It's still going to be distance L up and down, but we're going to make this triangle here where the distance horizontally is going to be V delta T prime divided by 2. It's going to be half of this distance. The full distance was V delta T prime, but this distance halfway is V delta T over 2. Okay, so this is, again, this is confusing, I understand. OK, 
Okay, we're gonna have to really think about this slowly. We're looking from the outside of the moving ship. We're gonna see the light go at this angle and come back down here. By the time the light comes back to the detector, the detector will have moved a distance V delta T. But we're, if we're inside the ship, the observer who's inside the ship doesn't see any of this happening. They just see the light go up and down, travel the distance L in a time delta T. Not delta T prime now. Okay, delta T prime and delta T. So the time it takes, the time that's happening from the outside and the time from the inside are different. Okay? <laughs> so uh, let's do this a little bit more carefully. Okay, so that we know that the time inside is just going to be still the same thing. Delta uh, 2L over C. However, the person outside is going to see the time as 2D over C. Remember D was the this hor this uh, distance, which is larger, right? By Pythagoras, right? We can use Pythagorean theorem to show that D squared is equal to L squared plus this change here, this V delta T over two. This is just Pythagorean theorem, right? Uh, C squared equals A squared plus B squared, right? Now, Rearranging these equations, I can come up with an expression for L that I can substitute in, and an expression for D that I can substitute in. Okay, so if I now plug these into my Pythagorean theorem, now I'm going to have C delta T prime. Remember, that's the time that the observer outside, the stationary observer sees the moving frame. Okay, that's delta T prime. So yeah, so delta T is the delta T is the is the time it takes inside. That's what the observer inside the spaceship sees. Delta T prime is from the outside. Now I know I'm repeating myself a whole bunch of times, but this is this is complicated and it's confusing. Okay. And it'll warp our brains in some ways. Just keep going. Alright, so uh, we can Square both, square everything. The the fours all cancel, and I end up with c squared delta t prime squared is equal to c squared delta t squared plus v squared delta t prime squared. Uh, bringing all the delta t primes over to the left hand side, factoring out delta t prime, and then dividing both sides by c squared minus v squared. Now, if I can factor out c squared from both the top and the bottoms, I can. I can do uh, a little, here, I can go, I can factor out, so it's going to be 1, right, c squared out of that one. And then if I factor c squared out of the bottom, that's going to be 1, and then it's, oh, sorry, 1 b squared over c squared. Okay, that's how I factor that out, and then they're going to cancel, and we're left with delta t prime is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now this is a very important little coefficient, which we're actually going to call gamma. Okay, so therefore, what this is telling us, what this, for this to, for this to, to, to work, okay, for, for the speed of light to be constant in both frames of reference, what has to happen is the clocks inside the rocket from the observer outside of the rocket have to slow down. The person inside the rocket sees the clock's ticking no problem, nothing's, nothing's changing, but the person outside will see the clock's ticking slower. Okay? So time is rel is rel time depends the, the rate in which a clock ticks not not physically but actually the the rate in which time goes the the universal time the time in which time exists the the vector of time whatever that is depends on how fast you're traveling the faster you go the slower your internal clock goes if you're traveling at the speed of light for a very long period of time, you will age slower. Okay, 
you've probably seen some sci-fi movies like Interstellar, for example. Uh, that has to do with, with heavy, with very big gravity sources. But gravity sources do the same same idea. Uh, that's general relativity. We're not going to get into that. But in the same way, if you're close to a very very large gravity source, or if you're traveling very very fast, close to the speed of light, we actually slow down the rate of time. So you may have heard of something called the twin paradox, where um, one twin stays on Earth, one twin travels at the near the speed of light, goes somewhere, and comes back. The one twin that stayed on Earth will be very old, and the one twin that left and came back will still be young, because their clocks have slowed. And this has been proven to work. I know this sounds crazy, right? <laughs> like time just time is just time, right? But we've shown this actually works. They've put atomic clocks on planes. And they've actually shown that the plane that, that's, that's traveling quite fast around the world, not, not even that fast compared to the speed of light, but you lose nanoseconds. Even in, the, in a trip across the, the Atlantic from America to England, they flew a, a jumbo jet, one atomic clock, stayed on Earth, one atomic clock, flew on the plane. Atomic clocks are just very, very precise clocks. They use cesium atoms and the, the decay of cesium atoms to, to measure time. And they're very, very, very precise. So we know that they don't drift. So we know that the clocks actually did lose a couple nanoseconds in that trip. This is mind-blowing stuff. Okay? Uh, and just, again, this, this term, this 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, uh, we can call that gamma. Okay? Just to save ourselves time sometimes. Okay? That's what... Uh, if I ever write that gamma term, that's what I mean. Now, let's see where this actually matters. You know, if if we're standing still, if, if the relative motion of the object we're observing is zero, right? It doesn't really matter, right? Because uh, zero divided by c squared is just zero. One minus zero is one. Uh, square root of one is one. One over one is one. So nothing changes. If we're traveling, you know, a tenth of the speed of light, now that's still very, very fast. Remember, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers a second. So if we're at point 0.1c, that's going to be 30,000 kilometers in one second. So that'd be one second. Uh, we could go, um, what would that be? You know, around the world in like a minute and a half or so. Right? You can go all the way around the world and come back in like a minute and a half or so, I think. That's just a quick, rough calculation in my head. I'm not sure. Maybe you can do that by yourself. Uh, but even at that ridiculous speed, it's only going to change uh, the, the rate of time or this gamma term. Right, This is gamma here. It's only going to change it by you know 0.5%. It's only when we start getting very, very fast. You know, Half the speed of light, we're only going to change things by 15%. At... 90% of the speed of light, time will slow down by a factor of 2. And then at, you know, 0.999999, right here, this is 99.9999% the speed of light, we're going to slow down by a factor of 200. All right, so the, the, um, the frame of reference of, it, of things slows. Now, there is a, a, a really weird idea that this leads us to. Light travels at the speed of light, right? Um, and really, the speed of light is a misnomer. The speed of light is just the rate in which anything that has no mass travels. Okay? But the speed of light travels at the speed of light. So this term should get infinitely large, and the rate of time should slow down to it being actually stopped. So in this viewpoint, light doesn't experience time. The light that exists from the Big Bang hasn't noticed that 13.8 billion years has passed. Light has no internal understanding of time. It only travels through space. If you're sitting still, you're traveling through time at the speed of light. This is this is weird. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of strange implications to all this stuff. Okay, let's let's look at an example. Uh, so a muon is like a it's like a 
electron. We saw in the standard model there's three types of electrons. There's our regular electrons, muons, and tauons that are just a bit weirder. Uh, and muons are weird because they, they're unstable. They can't exist for too long. Um, typically, it should, it should only last for about 2.2 microseconds, and then it'll fall apart. Uh, via this decay here. This is a Feynman diagram, but what happens? This muon um, gives off a what we call a negative weak boson and then goes off as an electron and it gives off two uh, neutrinos, a electron neutrino and a muon neutrino. Well, don't really worry about that, okay? It's just this is what happens here. We have it. Um, a muon, it becomes an electron, an antineutrino, and a regular neutrino. Okay? Now, the important thing is that this takes 2.2 seconds. What happens if instead this is happening inside a particle accelerator and we're firing protons at each other at 99.5% of the speed of light and it's giving off these muons that are traveling at these ridiculous speeds as well? How long will we see them? What, what will be the time scale for the decay in the frame of reference of the accelerator? What will we see? So what's going to happen here is using our, our, our uh, delta T prime equation, and we're plugging in uh, 0 0.995c. We're going to square that, then the c squares will cancel. It works out to be 22 microseconds. So that muon exists for 10 times as long inside that that uh, accelerator. And this is exactly what we see. This explains exactly why the these um, decays happen over a much longer period of time, because they're traveling so fast. Okay? We can actually see this occurring. The, the time, the, the clock, the internal clock, not, not a clock as in a physical clock, the actual passage of time for the muon is 10 times slower than the observer in the accelerator. Okay? So again, these are some, some big, scary ideas about the nature of the universe. So if, if this takes a while to get in your brain, it's okay. It's, 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 not, it's not easy, okay? But I want you to try some problems here. So uh, there's only three math, whoop, only three math problems, and I want you to watch these two videos. These are some some really good videos that help explain. Um, this is what this one's a Carl Sagan video, and this is one of the minute physics videos. All right, so uh, try these problems, and um, hopefully your brain doesn't hurt too much, but it's it's supposed to. Okay, it's it's supposed to at this point. All right, I'll be talking to you later.